Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Love is about trust. But have you ever been tempted to breach that trust? to read someone's diary, check their text messages, read their emails. Joyce Maynard writes about a time when she faced that temptation. Her essay is called My Secret Left Me Unable to Help. It's read by Jessalyn Gilsig, who has appeared on shows including Glee, Nip Tuck, and Vikings. As hard as it was sometimes caring for my children when they were little, back in those days I at least stood a reasonable chance of protecting my sons and daughter from pain and loss. The hard part hits later, when, fiercely as you love this person and desperately as you may worry, you can't come to your child's rescue. Worse, what you imagined you were doing to protect her may actually end up inflicting another form of injury, as my actions easily could have in what happened between my daughter and me. It was the fall of 2001, and the world felt like a particularly dangerous place. My children were grown and out on their own, one son at college, the other bumming around West Africa. At 22, my daughter Audrey had left to spend six months volunteering with a women's organization in a poor town in the Dominican Republic. Not long after Audrey started living in Baraona, she emailed that she had met a young man, Johnny who ran a kind of taxi service offering rides on the back of his motorcycle. He had given her a lift. She didn't tell me much, but I knew Johnny had come to the Dominican Republic from Haiti in search of a better life. Audrey said he was handsome, smart, funny, a great dancer, and wonderful to her. Within a month, she wrote to say she was in love. Then... Nothing. Unable to reach Audrey at her rented room, I sent breezy news reports, casual questions. How's Johnny? Then, I'm worried. Finally, I tracked her down by calling the neighbor's house. Even on that line filled with static, I could tell something was wrong. Her voice, usually so lively, sounded wary and defensive. I just can't talk now. There's a lot going on. Weeks passed, more silence, or almost worse, flat sound in one-line email messages. We'll write later. Don't worry. But I worried all the time now, more even than when I got the message from my son in Africa. I'm over the worst of the malaria now. He was writing to me, at least. From Audrey, nothing. In early spring... Six months since I had seen her last, I dreamed my daughter was running down a dirt road with her long braid flying behind her and her face a mask of grief. The dream felt real. That morning, I knew what I would do, though I feared my daughter might never forgive me. For years, I had known the password to her email account but never used it. Now, hands trembling on the keyboard, I typed it in. Slowly then, in messages she had written to friends, the story unfolded. She and Johnny had gone for their HIV test that December. Two weeks later, a clean bill of health for Audrey. But the man my daughter believed to be the love of her life was HIV positive. Back then, for an undocumented Haitian living in the Dominican Republic, the medical services necessary to keep him alive would be available only at a cost beyond his means. It got worse. They had mostly been careful, but not a hundred percent. And the test results Audrey got could not be viewed as accurate until three months had passed. 
Feeling as though the room was on fire, I scrolled through the messages my daughter had written over the week since then. There were letters to the American Embassy inquiring about Johnny emigrating to the United States if he were married to an American citizen. Letters inquiring about the options for treatment for both of them back home. If she came home. But for the moment, Audrey was still living with Johnny. Loving a man with whom she could not make love. Uncertain of her own health. All I wanted, reading this news, was to jump on the first plane to the Dominican Republic, throw my arms around my daughter. Only to do so, I would have to admit to having done this terrible thing. When I was very young, my mother read my diary. And though I loved my mother, I don't think I ever forgave her. Now I had opened my daughter's email account so I could know the truth, and the truth had brought nothing but terror and the awareness of my own powerlessness. Two months after discovering her secret, I broke into my daughter's email account one last time. That was the day I learned she'd had the second HIV test and was okay. I promised myself I would never again violate her that way. The person I picked up at the airport looked different from the one I'd put on the plane eight months before. Audrey had been to a place that no one in our family would ever know or fully be able to imagine. As we drove over the Golden Gate Bridge to our comfortable Marin County home, it appeared to me as though my daughter, the most hopeful person I knew, was not just tired, but weary of life. In the days that followed, she told her brothers and me little of her time abroad, and almost nothing of Johnny or the one-room shack they had shared. Though one day she called him, and afterward, her face was streaked with tears. I had recently purchased a 20-year-old Mercedes convertible, my first non-mom car. Now I made Audrey a proposal to take a road trip, top-down, all the way up the coast to the border of British Columbia. I was headed to see the man who was my boyfriend, though, really, the only destination that mattered to me was reaching what I took to be the dark and broken place in my daughter's heart. If she would just tell me what I already knew, I could offer comfort at last. But she was understandably dubious about this trip. We had a history of stormy times, particularly when traveling. "'I don't know about this plan, Mama,' she said." I feel like being mellow for a while. I told her we'd take as long as we wanted, so we packed our gear and hit the road. We had hiking shoes, backpacks, maps to hot springs, some of her music and some of mine. North we went through Mendocino and into Oregon. One afternoon we sat naked in a hot spring for nearly three hours in silence. On the Oregon coast we took off our shoes and ran on the dunes. We stayed at a tourist cabin in Washington where I bought Audrey a painted fungus of a cabin by a field in the woods that reminded us of our old house in New Hampshire. The simple days. Or that's how I remembered them. And then we were within an hour of our destination, the ferry in Port Townsend, Washington, where Audrey and I would say goodbye. She was taking a bus south to visit college friends, though I imagined that her old life felt very distant now. Even now, I can picture the stretch of road we were driving at that moment, and I remember the ballad Van Morrison was singing as we traveled it. I want to tell you something, Mama, she said. It might make you mad. There's nothing you can't say to me, I told her, gathering breath. This is a very hard thing. I pulled the car over onto the shoulder and turned off the engine, I held my daughter's hand and I felt the beating of my heart. Back in the winter, she began, Johnny and I took this test. There was not a lot to be said. I told her I'd do whatever I could to help, but I knew the problems my daughter had faced those last months were no longer the kind a parent can fix. The ferry at Port Townsend was next to the place where Audrey would catch the bus, so we rode together right up to the landing. Out of the trunk of the Mercedes, I lifted her backpack and hat, the painted fungus, 
a bag of raw almonds for the long bus ride, and two $20 bills. All the things a mother gives her child when there is something else the child needs that's nowhere to be found. After we said goodbye, I drove the car onto the ferry and climbed out so I could stand on deck as the boat motored out of the harbor. It would take six years for me to tell my daughter how I'd broken into her email account. Understandably, she felt betrayed. She managed to forgive me. Not only forgive me, but allow me to tell this story. Fiercely loyal as she is to the suffering people of Haiti, she asked that I clarify it was in the Dominican Republic, not in Haiti, that Johnny contracted HIV. Not all the bad things in the Caribbean happen in Haiti, she reminded me. And one more thing she would say, after hearing me describe my anguish over those many months and my obsession with making everything all right for her, when of course I couldn't. I wasn't really that broken person you pictured. By the time I got home from my time in the DR, I'd worked through a lot of the most difficult parts of this experience. I was in a stronger place for the lessons I'd learned. Over the years since, Audrey has gone three times to Haiti. She has accompanied Johnny to Dr. Paul Farmer's life-saving clinic in the mountains, and Johnny is alive. She has fallen in love a few times, gone to graduate school to pursue the path of school counseling. This summer, she will return once more to Port-au-Prince. You don't need to try and fix my life anymore, Mama, she tells me. I can handle that part on my own. It is a lesson long in the learning. Though the first intimations of this came to me that summer day seven years ago, when I stood on the deck of the ferry to catch a last glimpse of my daughter waving to me from the shore, with her pink hat and long braid and her wide, bright smile. We stood that way, waving for a long time as the boat moved steadily away from land, she in one country, I heading toward another. Until she was just a dot on the horizon, same as I must have been to her. We were off to live our lives. That's Jessalyn Gilsig reading Joyce Maynard's essay, My Secret Left Me Unable to Help. We'll catch up with Joyce after the break. Joyce Maynard's essay was published in 2009. She says that she knows it doesn't show her at her best. In my many years of writing about my life, I have learned that the richest and and most valuable stories are never the ones in which I am exhibiting some kind of exemplary or heroic behavior. They're really the moments when I'm flawed and sometimes really screwing up and definitely human. And this is one of those, for sure. I mean, this is the story. Look, it's a mother hacking into her adult daughter's email. It doesn't get too much worse than that. And I I do it because I know that my readers, or in this case my listeners, have also been there. They may not have done that, but we all have those impulses, or at least a lot of us do. Joyce's daughter Audrey wrote a response to her mother's essay. That response was published in Slate in 2009. Audrey wrote that initially she had some misgivings. She says she knew that she could ask her mother not to publish the piece, but instead she decided to edit the essay with her mother. Joyce says that now she thinks that her children have made peace with occasionally being the subject of her writing. Part of what I'm saying is, We all own our stories. I would not, I did not have the right to tell the story of Audrey's experience. But 
what I always say to my writing students, and I, I teach memoir, is there's one story and one story only that you totally own, and that is yours, the one that you lived. So this is not the story of a young woman who discovers that, they, that the man she's fallen in love with is HIV positive. It's the story of the mother of that young woman. That's the person whose point of view I inhabit, and that's, that's the story I wrote. As for whether Joyce regrets hacking into Audrey's email? Did logging into her email do anything for her? No, it probably did not. I guess I did it selfishly. I could not bear the anxiety and terror that I felt, believing, correctly as it turned out, that my daughter was in trouble. I logged in hoping to find out that I was wrong, Instead, I logged in finding me out, discovering that I was right. Um, Audrey didn't need my help through that event. The only way that my actions perhaps changed anything was that I worked very hard after she came home to help her feel safe in telling me what had happened. I'd like to think that she would have eventually told me anyway, but I made that space And maybe if I didn't know what had gone on, I wouldn't have been able to slow myself down the way I did to take that road trip. That crisis, I will call it a crisis, um, forced me to stop everything. Joyce lives in New Haven, Connecticut now. Her daughter lives in New Hampshire. And Joyce says that she's learned to let Audrey live her own life. I think... At its core, this is a story about the very recognizable impulse of just about every parent to protect her or his child from pain and how impossible that is. And one of the differences between me then and me now with my children that many years older is that I know that. I basically, at this point, I am standing on the sidelines praying on occasion, but I, I don't step in. I, we're way past that point. That's Joyce Maynard. She's a writer, and her latest book is a memoir of finding and losing her husband. It's called The Best of Us. Her website is JoyceMaynard.com. More after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for the New York Times. There is just so much going on in this essay. There's there's so much just life and struggle and love and combativeness and just all the mess of life, which I feel like Joyce writes about so well. She is perfectly willing to come clean about her own failings and transgressions and own up to them, both in life and on paper. She wrestles with with the people in her life and, and sort of wrestles it onto the page. These are just dicey issues, and it's an essay that tackles it head on. And, you know, really kudos to both mother and daughter in in navigating such, you know, treacherous terrain and, you know, c- coming out the other end. And here's Jessalyn Gilsig. The reason I chose this particular essay from Modern Love is that I connected so much with the struggle a mother has, I think, honestly, from the day your child is born, of realizing that although you are on this earth to protect this child, you are also here to let them go. And it's, to me, when I had my daughter, it was Perhaps the most sobering moment was realizing that I had the incredible gift of bringing this person into the world, but really my task was to release her into her life. And I thought that this story captured that contemplation so well and and also taught me that it's an ongoing process and an ongoing challenge that probably never really ends, but is a part of being a parent. Thanks again to Jessalyn for reading this week's essay. 
Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Additional help this week from Catherine Brewer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Special thanks to Julia Simon, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at the New York Times. Additional music, courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. By the way, my other job is hosting an NPR show called On Point. Check it out in your podcast feed. We'll see you next week.